When it got close to the plate, it did this. It might make you question your life choice a little bit. I'm gonna hit this, but then he throws 95 in games, I throw 95 in games, and I was like, yeah! So I made this glove, yeah. and he had an absolute missile. Dude, what is going on? Yeah! This pattern right here, the, this part of the glove. Ah, yes, that's a sword. Today we're breaking in my pink SSK Jigglypuff glove. The way I think about it is a pitcher strikes you out wearing a pink glove that says Jigglypuff on it. Question for you. If you face a pitcher wearing a pink glove that says Jigglypuff on it and he strikes you out, does that mess with you mentally? No, it's gonna feel like, well, it's all gonna get comfy. <laughs> <laughs> It's an SSK glove. It's a horizontal closing pattern. Thumb goes to like the pointer finger. So it closes kind of like this. Smaller pocket, but also mimics how my hand kind of pinches when I throw. That's why I got the horizontal pattern. I don't know which one I like better. I think I'm still leaning towards the vertical pattern, but uh, the horizontal pattern is just fine. Bounce pass. It passed the test. Does it catch the ball? Yes, it caught every ball very well. Second ball, it's caught. There's a lot of unique things about this glove though, starting off with the windings around the pinky and the thumb. That's supposed to stiffen up the pinky and the thumb without having to add padding and weight inside. Hey! This pattern right here, the, this part of the glove going from the pocket to the pinky is very wide, a lot wider than any other glove that I have. So that'll take some getting used to it so much so that when it closes, even if you close the thumb straight down, you don't kind of twist it in a horizontal pattern. If you close it vertically, you can see that the uh, thumb still closes to the ring finger. It's not intended to close thumb to pinky like this. Heel padding right here, you can see it has a cross stitch. Uh, it looks kind of like baseball seams, which is a cool design feature, but it's also supposed to stiffen that part up. When I'm feeling the padding in the thumb and the pinky and the palm, uh, there's not a whole lot there. It's very thin and it's lightweight, but uh, the glove maintains its stiffness. White leather interior with that black and pink katana it just really pops off there, which I really like. And one of the best features about this glove is it says Pudding, which is Jigglypuff in, uh, in Japanese. It's a Pokemon themed glove. I really like the design of it. I like how it feels on my hand. One thing that is a little bit weird with this extra length, when I go to put my hand in the glove, my pinky actually wants to slide right into this uh, padding, put my hand in and then twist it to move my pinky to get it into the pinky stall and then slide my hand the rest of the way in. Once my hand's inside, it's nice and comfortable. It fits snug. It doesn't feel like it's gonna fall off, but it doesn't also feel too tight. So I like to feel once my hand's inside, it just takes me a little bit to kind of wiggle my pinky in there. And that might loosen up as I play catch with the glove more. The web kind of looks like a sword right here, although it's meant to be kind of like a star, I think. Stitching here, it's again meant to stiffen up the web, but it also makes the web close kind of in the middle like this. Pudding. <laughs> Not the lightest glove that I have, but it's pretty close. Has a lot of weight savings here. They, they um, what, are the, what is it called? Well, they punched holes. <laughs> they punched holes right here in uh, all this leather, kind of perforated it. Pokemon. <laughs> I like this. I do want to use this in a game. Pretty much game ready right now. I just got to get used to the, the closing pattern. Pudding. Pokemon. 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 <laughs> Design wise, definitely my top five, just because you know, I like the theme of the gloves. Not sure yet on the uh, usability of it and the way it feels on my hand. I would consider it average right now, but it's up there. I like this one. Uh, and I'm looking forward to using it in a game because it's Jigglypuff. I just think it's cool that Jigglypuff's going to strike some hitters out. <laughs> Makes me laugh. The Prince, uh, you are most favorite Pokemon? Uh, no, <laughs> but just funny. <laughs> yeah, I need, I need more, yeah, more, more spray paint. So a couple things about today's bullpen. Number one, um, I don't have a ton to work on. The problem with that mindset is, you know, I'm on a 19 inning scoreless streak right now. I've been pitching really well and you don't want to let yourself get complacent. You don't focus in the pen, you create some bad habits and all of a sudden your good streak turns into a bad streak real quick. So first half of the pen, I was like spraying balls everywhere. And, uh, couldn't figure it out and I think it was a lack of focus. What the f I was thinking about grips, I was thinking about mechanics, and I was thinking about everything except for 
Ay, 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 ay. Where I was throwing the ball. Dude, what is going on? I'm so confused. So in the last like 10 pitches of the pen, I really locked it in. I said, okay, I'm not taking my eyes off the glove. That was a good pitch, finally. I'm gonna put a really big focus here at the end of the pen on making sure I'm locked in on the target, on command, one singular focus. And then I hit every spot and everything kind of came back. The movements got better, locations got better. Mechanics actually felt better too. You need to have a clear focus for the pen. Pudding, yeah. Pudding. Jigglypuff. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is my changeup. If I don't get the seam orientation of the ball exactly perfect, then my changeup doesn't having much movement so my grip has been like this and you can see my middle finger is not on the seam it's on the inside of the seam but the problem is that's putting this knuckle this knuckle needs to be in the center of this horseshoe but it's not it's close to the top so today's adjustment very slight i moved my grip from here where the finger is not on the seam to here where the finger is on the seam but what that did is it put this pointer finger right in the middle of the horseshoe so now when this ball is rotating it's rotating through this spot and you can see it's just an even circle the whole entire rotation all right that actually had the bite that i've been looking for for a while i saw some that were really like straight and then really darted like they hit a, a pocket of air or something and then went boom you want something that looks like it's definitely going one direction then darts differently and it's too quick for their eyes to handle it another thing that's been going on recently is my energy levels have been a little bit down i've talked about this a little bit before Oh, a ball's coming to get me. And I think that's because my conditioning hasn't been quite up to par. I haven't been doing quite enough work. Oh, you're a subscriber. Thank you. So when I get to the game, I'm getting this like energy dump. So today I'm making sure to go a little bit extra hard in my conditioning. I'm gonna go at a little higher heart rate, a little bit less time in between sets. Yeah, I'm filming YouTube right now. I'm not gonna change too much because I don't wanna drain myself for my next start. So over the season, I'm constantly making slight little adjustments to my routine based on my metrics and four at, based on how I'm feeling. Do you subscribe to Japanese channel or American channel? You speak English and Japanese? Impressive. A lot of you probably played Pokemon Go when it first came out, but if I asked you now who still plays Pokemon Go, not very many of you would say yes. But I can guarantee you there are a lot of people in the world that still do play Pokemon Go, especially huge here in Japan. And this week in Yokohama, the Pokemon Go World Championships are going on. People literally travel from all over the world and then they like battle as part of teams. I'm still trying to learn all of what goes on, but there's a lot of people out. There's a drone light show, Pokemon drone light show. So we're gonna go check out what's going on. I'm gonna meet up with Megan. She's a huge Pokemon fan, loves Pikachu. I think I found her. Pikachu is saving my seat. It's a good spot you found. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, I've been here an hour. You've been here an hour? <laughs> Prime spot, I hope. <laughs> Did you go shopping today? Oh, I brought this from USA. Oh, okay. And Charmander <laughs> and Charmander, Squirtle. Who else is on there? Got Bulbasaur. Yeah. Bulbasaur. Got I like Bulbasaur. He's just kind of lame. I mean, he could be the snuggliest. Not if you're allergic to grass, like I am. <laughs> so wait, when do the drones go off though? 8.30 to 8.55, so a 25 minute show. And I ran to get here. It's a good workout. Okay, you need bye. to up your cardio anyways. I do, I do. We also both have like super good drone <laughs> hearing. Like we're very tuned into the sound of the drones. Like I picked them up about three minutes ago when they said, oh, there they are. <laughs> Gotta have some legendaries in here. There we go. Oh, that's cool how the wings are moving. The lightning's sweet. Oh, boy. Boy. Pikachu. Voltorb. That kind of looked like the Death Star. If it wasn't red and white, I think shows over probably what time is it? That was cool. The nerdy side came out of me and I was super excited. Everything in Japan is so much more meticulous. Where can people see your Japan experience? On my TikTok and my Instagram. What is it? Uh, Meg Michaels underscore three. There's not much baseball on there though. We haven't played the best baseball since you've been here, but we're, start we're starting to come out of it. So I went back to look at uh, my bullpen just to check out my mechanics. Shota is throwing right next to me. So I thought it might be kind of interesting to talk about a couple of similarities and a couple of differences in our mechanics. Starting with the similarities. The first thing you'll notice is we both get pretty deep in our back leg. It doesn't really matter how you start. The first major movement towards the plate is like dropping into your back leg. Super important to have enough strength to be able to maintain that motion many times per game for a starter but also to be able to get deeper in your back leg if you're not strong enough and you can't get deep in your back leg then you don't get as much energy and you can't throw quite as hard generally speaking not true for everybody so that's the first similarity the second similarity is how the glove side functions if you watch the glove side at maximum external rotation of the throwing arm so when the throwing arm gets all the way laid back 
watch what the glove side does. It completely stops. And that's a principle that has to happen for every elite thrower. So you can see our glove sides are moving, they're moving, they're moving. As soon as our arm hits maximum external rotation, the glove side firms up, it stops, it doesn't move until the ball releases from our hand and then the glove side starts to move. Number three is kind of not mechanical, but uh, it's super important. Our eyes are on the target the whole time. We're not pulling our head, we're not looking down at the ground. Our eyes are locked on the target and yeah, our head might sway a little bit, but the eyes are locked on the target the entire time. And that's super, 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 super important for command. Let's talk about a couple of the differences. And the first main one I see is how we leave the rubber. So we both lift our leg, he lifts his leg, I'm going out of a slide step but we both start our movement towards the plate when I start my movement my front leg kind of kicks 45 degrees forward so my left foot never really crosses over and gets in line with my back foot or gets towards the pitching rubber it goes towards the plate instead by contrast you can see when he starts his delivery his right leg because he's a lefty his right leg actually kicks behind towards the rubber and that counter rotates his hips meaning it rotates his hips away from the plate. If you look at my lead leg action, it actually rotates my hips a little bit open towards the plate. Um, now, I used to throw like him um, a little bit more with that lead leg action back in college in my early pro days, but it just does not work for my hip structure. I was inconsistent. My hips wouldn't rotate well. He throws 95 in games. I throw 95 in games, and we've both been elite pitchers for a long period of time. There's a lot of different ways to do things. A second difference that I notice, the glove side elevation. As the arm is reaching maximum external rotation, our glove sides are almost identical. My glove side actually elevates before that point, when I'm still moving towards the plate, my glove side elevates towards my shoulder height, whereas his is down by his waist. Arguments to be had on both sides of this, one argument for elevating the glove side is it puts something up in the hitter's vision, kind of where your hand's gonna come through the zone, so maybe they don't get as good a look at the ball. An argument on the side of keeping your glove side low is it's actually a little bit more natural and it kind of keeps your torso super stable. When you elevate your glove side, you have a tendency to like lean your torso back and then you have to lean your torso forward. So there's a little bit of like counter movement going on. And if you raise your glove side a little bit, it's right down by your waist. So it's a much more natural position for humans to be in. Also can kind of create a little bit of deception when you see the glove side down low, you don't know exactly where the ball is gonna be coming from. So I've heard arguments on both sides, but kind of an interesting difference. And the third thing I noticed that's different is our lead leg action. There's two main ways that you can block with your front leg. And for those who aren't pitchers and don't know what blocking is, when your front leg lands, it needs to stop all the momentum that you've had towards the plate as quickly as possible because that's what's gonna transfer it up to the throwing arm. You can imagine like rolling a towel and kind of like trying to pop the end and your lead leg has to stop, pop. Now there's two ways to do that. You can stop completely and let the energy transfer or you can like stop and rebound a little bit and pull back. In my experience, I like the action where I stop and pull back. And so in the pitching delivery, what that means is my lead leg lands and then it actually starts to straighten before I release the ball. The other way of doing it where you stop completely is kind of the, what, the way Shota does it. He lands, his front leg doesn't move, it stays bent until the ball's released and then his body kind of comes up and over his front shin as opposed to the front shin pushing back. Now I mentioned earlier, he throws 95 in games, I throw 95 in games. Doesn't really matter which lead leg action you use. Both come with positives and negatives. The important part is that you sync it up with the rest of your delivery and that it's then that you land very, very forcefully and you stop the energy as quickly as possible. That's what matters for pitching velocity. I find it interesting looking at other people's mechanics. I learn stuff and maybe you guys learned something today too. If you did, hit that subscribe button. it has hit a major stall and this is why. So let me give you a little bit of the history. So I made this glove right here and I thought it was gonna be good and I was gonna finish it off. It took me a while to make it, but I was pretty happy with it for the first attempt. Then I realized that uh, if I had to make any adjustments to the leather patterns, I just didn't have a way of doing it reliably because it wasn't on the computer. It was just gonna be a mess if I didn't nail it the first time. So I decided that I was gonna put it all on the computer. You can see like the inner part of the glove and you can see the finger pads, the thumb pads, the finger pads right here. This is the palm part of the glove. You can even see in between here. You can even see like this blue part right in here is the plastic part that goes in between the thumb pads to stiffen it up. So I've been making this thing into a model, but the problem is every time I go to cut this stupid thing out, a piece is wrong and I can't figure it out. So what I have is I have here some felt. This is, it looks like a turkey. Look at this, wait, hold on. That looks kind of like a 
Thanksgiving turkey. I have this as well. Yeah, this is like the inner part. So this is all going well, except that there's a couple adjustments that I need to make and I can't figure it out. So today and like the last like week or two, I've spent all my time making these. See, I have this little pile of like cut out graveyard here that haven't even been used because every time I cut them out and then I go to line them up with the glove, I'm like, this just isn't gonna work. After about a week of doing it, I figured out, oh, I should probably measure my pattern, my physical pattern, this one here, and see if it matches up with the pattern that's on the computer. But I measured it now and it doesn't match up. So I don't know if something happened to my model and someone changed something. I, that'd be me, I'm the only one working on it. And I can't figure it out. And this is what my apartment looks like. I got stuff everywhere. I should be making way more progress. Look, oh, here's, here's another uh, graveyard piece. I'm a college dropout. Otherwise I would just have nailed this the first time. I can't figure it out. I'm frustrated. Stay in school, kids. It is an away game at Jingu Stadium. Lots of home runs hit there, so hopefully none of those. The plan for today is to do exactly what the shirt says. Live by the sword. And if you want to get your Live by the Sword shirt, check it out, trevorbauer.com. Lots of strikeouts tonight. No balls in the air. Hopefully it's a good day. NPB doesn't want me to like, you know, advertise their product for free. So I can't show you even just little game clips, even though the game clips are kind of all over the internet anyway, but I can't show them. So enjoy this dramatic reenaction of the night. So the first hit of the game was a righty and I just fixed my split in the bullpen two days ago. So I was like, oh, I have a two strike count. I'm gonna try to throw a split to a righty. I was like, yeah. He was kind of out there like this and he had a big leg kick and then he's like, ah, I'm gonna hit this. But then when it got close to the plate, it did this. And he's like, oh no, I can't hit it and he struck out. So that was strikeout number one. And then um, Murakami came up. So then I threw him a fastball down and in at 95. So he's like, uh, nope, I don't want that one. And then the next one I threw is the same splitter and it spun perfectly with that circle I was talking about. And it started exactly where the fastball was. So he's like, oh yeah, I want that one. Cause I just saw it. So I'm gonna hit a homer and he goes to swing like this, but then the ball dropped off the table and he's like, oh, I missed it. And then the next one, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna throw a curveball in the dirt. And then he was like, I got this. I can hit this pitch. It's a fastball up. I'm gonna hit a homer. Yeah! But then it was a curveball in the dirt and he struck out. So I got out of the first inning with two strikeouts. The fourth inning, I think, I don't remember exactly, but Murakami came up again and I was like, ooh, okay, I can get you. So I got ahead of him real quick, but then it ended up in a 3-2 count. I had to throw a fastball because I didn't really want to walk him. And he was like, ha ha, I see this. I'm gonna get you. It's 3-2. I have this ball right here. I'm just gonna throw this as hard as I can away and I'm gonna beat you with it. So I wind up and put my bat down. E yeah! And then on the way to the plate, the ball's going like this. As he sees it coming, he's like, oh yes, I'm gonna hit this. E yeah! But then right about here, he decides it's gonna be a ball. And he's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta stop swinging because it's gonna be a ball. So he goes like, yeah! And then he like starts to go to first base because he thinks it's a ball. But I'm on the mound and I'm like, ha ha, yes, that's a sword. Ah! And then they point at the third base. And the umpire was like, yes, he's out. And so I sorted Murakami. At one point, there was a ground ball back to me. I had to put my sword down. It's a curveball, and I threw a curveball. And then I finished over here like this, but then the ball was kind of bouncing over here. But it was a little bit too far behind just to put my glove behind my back. So I had to like scoot back a little bit and bend down like this to catch it behind my back. But I had my pudding glove on, and Julie Puff snagged it. And then I just kind of threw it over to first like this. I meant to do that. Everyone can kind of believe me that I actually meant to do it because I purposely scooted myself back to like catch the ball behind my back. That's two games in a row with a behind the back catch. Scoreless streak comes to an end at 24 innings. You have two in the sixth. And yeah, the sixth inning came along and then I was like, oh, I'm gonna be stupid and give up runs. So I threw a slider eee! and the righty just kind of like dinked it in for a hit. And then he like was really fast. So he stole second. But at this point we were up like eight to nothing. So I wasn't really paying attention to the base runners. And then I gave up a hit to, who did I give up a hit to? Oh yeah, another righty came up and I threw a curveball and I was, oh, it was two strikes. And I was like, oh, if I just throw this on the plate, he's gonna swing. So I threw it and I was like, yeah. But instead of doing the yeah out here, I like did it early and I was like, eh. So I was like, eh, instead of yeah. And he did one of these, he froze and then he like kind of scooted back and then he like hit it. So it was kind of like one of these swings. Oh boy, uh, eh. But then he blooped it in for a hit. So that was a run. And then the next guy came up and I did the exact same thing. The exact same thing. Yeah. And he hit an absolute missile for a double. And it wasn't a homer, thankfully. And then I struck the next guy out on a rage fastball, just super, super mad. And I was just like, yeah. And it was like 96, boom, right down in white. And he took it for strike three, but then I was super mad. So I went out for the seventh. And then I was like, I'm just gonna throw a fastball down and away because you know, it's eight to two. And like, he's gonna take a strike, but he did not take a strike. And he was just like, bah! 
Ah! And yeah, he hit his first career homer off me, so that was the third run. So, uh, seven innings, three runs, five strikeouts, and a walk. We won nine to three tonight. That's win number nine for me. I'm now second in wins in the Central League, so we're climbing the leaderboards pretty rapidly. Subscribe so you don't miss more dramatic reenactments.